We've got a couple of ideas to uh, to get to before we um, kind of finish off the, 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 the course and get to the exam. Uh, today we're going to talk about what are called repeated games. Uh, and next week, or right, tomorrow, we're going to talk about the idea of credibility and threats and, and uh, commitments and promises. Now, one of the six questions that we had uh, about that sort of defined game theory was, you know, is it a simultaneous game or a one-shot game? And so today we're going to look at this a little bit of this theory behind repeated games and why repeated games are important. Uh, there's a Nash equilibrium idea will keep coming up, and uh, that'll be our our kind of analytical tool which helps us predict what we think is going to happen is repeated games. But we have some more intuitive ideas about strategic interaction here. There's a couple of interesting uh, names for these strategies. One's called the Grimm strategy, um, and the other uh, strategy, which you might be familiar with, we call tit for tat. And these, these ideas emerge out of the concept of Nash equilibria. So uh, you'll see that the Nash equilibria idea really does have embedded in it quite a, a number of interesting, uh, interesting themes. Now, the... Um, the reading for this, I, I put up a, the first part of this lecture, I put up a chapter from uh, Joel Watson's book, which is the basis for the little uh, table that you, you have in the handout. And, but you don't need to go back and read that necessarily for the exam. As long as you can grasp the stuff today, there's, there's no problem. Um, there, there is material in Chapter 10 on, uh, on, on Chapter 11 on re repeated, repeated the prisoner's dilemma, which is what we'll look at in the last half of today's class. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll be going through the idea of as ideas of credible commitments in Chapter 10. Okay, just so you can kind of keep up to where we are. Uh, remember that the exam is coming up a week Friday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. I'll hold some extra sessions this week, and then uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday next week as well. Okay. Again, for the exam, just suggestion-wise, I'd go over past year's exams and including past midterms, okay? The exam can cover the whole semester's work. Uh, the emphasis probably be on the latter half, but in this year, we didn't get to the, in the midterm exam to the same content that we have in previous years, so some of those questions will be, questions like that will be on the final. So when, as you're doing your studying, I mean, I think a practical way to study the exam is to go through past exams, okay? And the... Um, uh, when you can't answer stuff, uh, come to the tutorials. And if it's possible, we might be able to get a blog going on the um, one of the guys at the UCTL is working on getting a, uh, a blog going for the for the course. But I don't know whether we're going to have that done before the end of the uh, before the exam. But that would be kind of a good place to where you can see some answers and discuss uh, a little bit about the um, answers to the past. Ex Past years' exams, some of them are some of them are tricky. Okay, but work, work your way through it, them, and if you can't figure out what they are, then come along to these. The answers come along to these tutorials. Sometimes the answers are posted more often than not, but in some cases I don't have all the answers posted up there. Okay, now just to kind of motivate this a little bit, um, in the last couple of years, I have met two people who I've become good friends with who have been married three times. Each, okay, not to one another, uh, but it's it's. I kind of find that mind-boggling in a way, you know. I mean, how many times do you have to kind of go through this before you learn that maybe it won't work? And um, I mean, marriages and uh, official marriages and wedding ceremonies uh, are one way of of it turns out making commitments a little bit more credible than they otherwise might be. But relationships are tough, and the, one thing about relationships is that. They're, they involve repeated interaction. Okay, now uh, having had a successful marriage for about ten or twelve years, then have it, having it fall apart, which was emotionally very disturbing. Okay, because I didn't expect any of this stuff to happen. Uh, you kind of get into a relationship, and you're in this phase where there's a real harmony of your interests. Okay, I mean. Sometimes they call it lust, but other times they call it a harmony of interest. You're, you're like being with one another, doesn't seem any conflict. And then as, you, as your interaction goes on, you know, the little individual differences start, start to pop out. And that's, remember, game theory, wouldn't, there wouldn't be any problems if everybody was the same, but people are different. And in relationships, these, 
uh, in repeated interaction, these differences start to pop up. Okay. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you watch your friends. I mean, especially as you get a bit older, you see these couples that are together and you wonder, why are they together? They're just at one another all the time. It just seems so bad, you know. You watch other couples seem to get along, cooperate, cooperate. You know, it's great life. And then you see these people that cycle back and forth, you know, just, they, you know, one year, one little time period, they're, they're getting along really well, doing lots of cooperative things, helping one another. And then they cycle into a kind of a self-destruct kind of thing for one another where they're hurting one another and then they're back into the cooperative sort of phase. And, you know, the, the repeated, game, repeated interaction has these, these um, experiences of great opportunities for cooperation, but also great opportunities for mutual harm, okay? And then there's all this cycling behavior that goes on as well. And so the stuff we're going to look at in these repeated games is going to be like that. Uh, it turns out that there's lots of different equilibria that you could have. And the uh, the one where everybody's cooperating together, that could work, you know? The one where everybody's mutually antagonistic, eh, that could work as well. And the cycling ones also can be equilibria. And that's a bit of a problem. We have these sort of multiple equilibria, which is the same. We had little coordination games, little two-by-two two ideas. And you wonder, well, how are people actually going to settle down on one? But you still want to try to understand this idea of, a, of, a, of an equilibrium, sustained kind of interaction over time. And that's what the repeated games analysis can give us. Now, the first game that we're going to look at is a finite repeated game. Now, it turns out, and it's going to only be repeated twice, okay? whereas most... Interesting repeated situations could go on for more than two times, and they keep going on. And sometimes when you wonder, how long are they going to go on for? You know? Maybe they won't go on. Maybe they'll fall apart. Okay? And that's the interesting thing about them, is the future is uncertain with these, re with these uh, more interesting repeated games. But the first one we're going to look at is a, is a twice-repeated game. And let's just have a little look at the, the payoff matrix in this twice-repeated game. Uh, there's a couple of new terms that you've got to think about when you're thinking about repeated interaction. Uh, they're up on the left-hand side, stage game and sub-game, which we'll look at in a, in, a, in a second. But for the moment, just have a look at this payoff matrix, okay? It's, it, it's an artificial little game. Uh, two players, red and blue. It's a simultaneous game. And the interesting thing about it is if you look at the best responses in this game, what do we have is two Nash equilibria. One over here where red plays bottom, the B, and the blue player plays Y. And then the second Nash equilibria over here where the red player plays A and the blue player uh, plays Z. Now, this is not quite the same as the Battle of the Sexes, okay? But it is a little bit like the Battle of the Sexes in the sense that there's two equilibria and there's disagreement about the equilibria, okay? The red player would kind of prefer this equilibria. The blue player would prefer that equilibria, like in the Battle of the Sexes. Except for there is one difference that's kind of interesting, and that's this outside option over here is that the payoffs are pretty good over here, right? Uh, four for the red player, three for the blue player. I mean, pretty good. Well, they're better for the red player for sure, okay? Four is better, four is better than two. Four is better than one. And for the blue player, it's certainly better than this equilibria here. Okay, because three is better than one. It's not as good as that one over there. Okay, but the idea is, if you can think of these as kind of cooperative outcomes that are better for both, they're sort of missed out in these two particular equilibria here. Okay. Now, when we're talking about equilibria, you sort of think, ah, oh, what is this engineering? No, it's just beliefs. What do people believe? What could they expect? And we worked out that the Nash equilibrium idea is sort of gives us some sensible things to to predict. Okay, up here in the top right, we have A and Z. That's um, one set of expectations. If people believe that, and they're, they, uh, each the players believes that, then they're making best responses to the other pl each other players. It is true that the, the blue player gets pretty good outcome here, and the red player doesn't in that one. But that's one thing to expect. Okay, and then the other one is the is the B and the and the Y uh, equilibria. Again, the red player is a little bit better off than the previous equilibria, and the blue player is a little worse off than the previous equilibria, but it's still a set of expectations, okay? It's not as, as, as good for both, but um, it's, it's something that could emerge It's pretty reasonable out of the game. Anything else, we would say, isn't reasonable, okay? And that's where we go through that argument when people say, well, why do you believe in Nash equilibria? You think, well, 
Why not? Okay, give me something else that you might think. Like what about this one here, A and X? You know, should we expect A and X to to be played as it as as an outcome of the game? And you think, well, if the players think that way, and these are their payoffs, then the red player would be thinking the blue player is going to play X. But why would the blue player play X when Z is, gives him more? Okay. So I'd be expecting him not to play a best response. And, I mean, that just doesn't seem to be a sensible thing to do, given they're intelligent, rational players. You expect them to look after their own interests, take advantage of their own interests. So if the blue player and the red player both believe about A and X that that's happening, then the blue player would be doing something a little bit irrational. Okay? And the blue player might not be the kind of person that's going to do something irrational, and the red player probably shouldn't think of them as doing something that's going to be a little bit irrational. Okay? So A and X doesn't, even though it's got some nice payoffs, doesn't look like it's a reasonable thing to expect in a one-shot game. And what we're going to see is that when we look at this as a repeated game, we, w we will have a Nash equilibria of the repeated game where you, we will see that um, the red player can play uh, A and the blue player will play X. Okay, so the idea, and the whole idea of this finite repeated game example is to get across the notion that when things get repeated, sometimes you can get behavior happening, which you wouldn't expect to happen if it was a one-shot game. Okay? And why does that happen? Well, what's, to sort of shorten the story, this equilibria here is one where the blue player gets a good payoff. Okay. And you can think the red player will promise to play that in the second round, or play his strategy that goes into that second, second round, if the blue player will do something in the first round that isn't his best response. Let me say that again. Okay. The way we're going to get this behavior emerging, where the red player can play A and the blue player can play X, is that when they're thinking about the game, they're not thinking about it one shot, they're also thinking about the future. If the red player can somehow make a promise or a commitment to play this in the second round, strategy A, then the blue player is going to be better off and give a high payoff. Okay, now that's that's pretty good. Okay, and associated with that promise could be, well, if you don't do this, I'm going to play B. Then you're going to, your best response is going to be Y, and you're going to get stuck with one. Okay, and the reason they can do that in the in the in the repeated game is that there is a future to think about. Okay. And when they get to that future, they can look back and see what happened in the present and decide what they're going to do. So that's the idea of the repeated games is it opens up new strategic possibilities where, where uh, players can look back, take account of the past, I mean observe the past, take account of it in their strategic interactions. Okay. So let's, let's kind of go through this the little game tree in this uh, example. And what I've done is... Um, when you're thinking about repeated games, you have the, the underlying game that's going to be repeated, and we call that the stage game. Okay? It's, it's not a sub-game like we had before. It's just, this is just at a particular stage. There's one round, game gets played. Second round, game gets played. Third round, game gets played. Okay? And that, that same game is being repeated, repeated, repeated. We call that the stage game. Now, when, tomorrow when we come and look at uh, Threats and Promises, we're going to look at two simple games, one called the threat game and one called the promise game. Okay? And the, uh, those, those will be games which you want to see could be repeated as well. Okay? Here we just have um, a, um, a simple repetition of this two by three game. And in the first stage, I've just put the game has to be played. So the players, what are the players going to do? Well, they have to make a choice what they're going to do in this first stage. Now in the second stage, they get the opportunity to look back at what happened in the first stage, okay? And so what I've done is I've, it's kind of hard to draw the whole game tree. It gets kind of messy. But what you can think of is that supposing the red player plays A, the blue player plays X, and they get these payoff four and three, then something will happen, okay, in the, in the second stage. Or if they play this combination of A and Y, then something will happen here. So if they play this one, then something will happen. If they play that... B and, and Z, then something will happen. So each of these branches kind of comes out of the first stage game and gets us into a second stage game. Okay? And I've just pulled out one as an example. Okay? Just, I mean, there's basically, we'd have to put in six of these things to, to capture all the possibilities, which gets a bit unwieldy, and you'll want to try and draw those things. But let's look at this uh, 
game at the second stage. Now, the second stage is a, is a repetition of this first stage. But what are your payoffs in the second stage? Good question. What are the payoffs in a repeated game? Remember, the beginning I kept saying, when you were thinking about uh, uh, strategic interaction, you want to ask yourself, what are the, what are the payoffs? What are, how, what are, how are we going to interpret them? Well, when you repeat a game, you know, uh, like in a relationship game, you know, you, you have this week and you have some good things and bad things. You have next we have some good things and bad things. You have next week and you have good things and bad things. And these things keep going on. And But each sort of slice is its own kind of set of payoffs, you know. And then you're sitting there, and the way we think of it is you think of a stream of payoffs, okay? There's a stream of payoffs for you. There's a stream of payoffs for the other guy. The thing about the stream, it isn't one number. It's several things that could happen. And what you have to think about is, well, how do people think about stuff that happens now, good or bad, with stuff that happens Later on, good or bad. And then a little bit later on, good or bad. And a little bit later on, good or bad. Believe me, when you're younger, you, you tend not to think of that stuff in the future. But once you get to my age, you start thinking, I've got about 20 years left. I'm thinking really hard about what's going to happen in these next 20 years. Whereas when I was 20, it was like, ah, life is cool, you know? I've got 60, 80 years. I don't have to really think about that. Well, you know, once you get to be 60, you start thinking, ooh, as a male, you know, 78, 80, that's it on average. So I want to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what's happening in these subsequent, subsequent games. Uh, well, at, at stages. Now what we've done here is the payoffs in the first stage are, uh, let's, let's take this particular cell here, red A and uh, blue Z. So in the first stage, they're one and four. Okay. Now in the second stage, Depends what's played. It could be four and three. It could be zero and zero. It could be one and four. It could be zero and zero. It could be two and one. It could be zero and zero. Okay. So it's like first stage. It's one and four. Second stage it could be this. It could be that. It could be lots of things. Right. Supposing we make this assumption, we just take the total payoffs. Okay. So it's like I get a payoff of ten now. I get a payoff of twenty next year. I get a payoff of five the year after that. What's that? Ten and twenty and five. That's like uh, what? Thirty-five. So I'm just adding them up, okay? Now, you might think, I don't really want to add them up. I mean, would I, would I really want 35 now and nothing and nothing? Or nothing and nothing and 35? Or, you know, something other spread around? Like, the total is kind of not very sensitive to the distribution across these periods. It, it, you're sort of looking at a total and you say, I don't really care how it, it, it happens, whether I get a lot now and nothing later, or nothing now and a lot later, or something in between when you're looking only at the total. Okay? So it's, a, it's kind of a hard assumption, but at the moment, just stick with the total because it's easier to calculate the numbers. When we get to the repeated prisoner's dilemma game, uh, and uh, we have more periods, we're going to want to try to take account of this idea that you don't want to just add things up. Okay? But just for the moment, let's add them up. And so what I did is I, I added these things up for you. Okay? Being, took out my little calculator, and I added... I took a red 1 and a blue 4, and I added it to these numbers. A red 1 and a blue 4, and I added it to these numbers. A red 1 and a blue 4, and these are just the results of that addition. Everything in this cell here is the sum of these numbers plus 1 and 4. Why 1 and 4? Because if they play red A and blue Z in the first round, they're going to get payoffs of 1 and 4. So that's what they get in the first round. So what will happen in the second round well, it'll depend what they do, but this is all the possibilities. Okay, so these are the total payoffs at the end of the game if they've played A and X in the first round, A and Z in the first round. Okay, so the the assumption in this particular example is that the playoffs in the repeated game are the sum of your own payoffs in the each of the stage games. And you think, well, okay, what's if this is uh, What's going to happen out here at the end, uh, if these are the payoffs, and we've played A and Z in the first round, what are players' best responses? Well, you know, you go through the best responses. Five is better than one. Three is better than one. Two is better than one. Eight is better than seven. Uh, five is better than four. Four, and we plug those in. And it's exactly the same pattern of best responses as we had in the stage game. Now, that's kind of... You know, that sort of makes sense, right? Because what all we've done is it, if we've just added the same number, one to every one of the red numbers here, so it's not going to affect the relative size of these things. The best responses for the red player are going to stay the same. Similarly, for the blue player, all we've done is added the number four to every one of these blue numbers here, so the pattern of best responses is going to stay the same. And that's what happens out over here. Okay. So at the second stage, 
given that we've specified what's happening in the first stage, the best responses are exactly the same as we had before. Now, um, what we're thinking of, if you like, is this particular game here in the red circle we can call a sub-game. Remember we had the idea of... Uh, Earlier on, we were looking at a game tree, and we put that little piece of it that was just kind of a game in its own right. That's a sub-game. It's got to be a game in its own right, okay? Uh, um, so this is a sub-game, and the Nash equilibria of this sub-game are just what we've got over here. Right? When we look at the repeated games, finitely repeated games, twice repeated, what's going to happen is we've got the first stage, but we do the usual, you know, backward induction, look forward, roll back, the roll back equilibrium idea, we say, well, let's go to the end and see what we would do at the end, and then we'll kind of work back to the beginning. Okay, well, at the end, and at, at this particular end, we would expect either this or that. Okay, we would expect either red B and uh, blue Y, or red A and blue Z to be what would happen if we get to that endpoint. And, and for every one of these branches, exactly the same thing is going to work out. Okay? So, uh, what, I mean, I didn't draw them all down. You can kind of take it on faith or you can work it out yourself. But the idea is that each of those branches, you're just adding fixed numbers to things. And so, at the end game, very interesting concept, in finitely repeated games, there is an end game. And we want to go out there and see what's going to happen at the end. Okay? And it... Uh, in the end game, we would expect these two Nash equilibria. Okay? And the reason we do that is that sub-game perfect kind of idea. We sort of think, look, at any little game at the end game is going to be its own little sub-game. We're trying to predict what's going to happen there. There is no future after that because this is a finitely repeated game. And so we expect people to play mutual best responses. We don't expect them to play things that don't involve mutual best responses. And it's, that's why we end up with trying to predict it's going to be either one of these Nash equilibria here, you know, A and Z, B and Y. You know, we got the focal point stuff. We're not really sure how they're going to coordinate on this, but this is just the old battle of sexes at the end. And it's got to be resolved somehow. Okay? So we use, in the, in the repeated game reasoning, we're using the basic logic that we had before, but we go to the end. Okay? We go to the end, and we work out what do we expect to happen there, and then we work back to the beginning. Now, it turns out, okay, that if you're looking at a, the Nash equilibria in the in the big game, the overall game, the repeated game, it turns out that you can think, oh, if people play their Nash strategies at each stage of the game, okay, let's take, let's take for example, uh, we know that one and four is a Nash equilibrium, okay, of the stage game, and so they could play that in round one, and they could play that in round two, and then the total payoffs would be 2 and 8. Okay. Now, it turns out that is a Nash equilibria of the repeated game. Okay. You've got to kind of go through the logic. You sort of think, well, it tells me what their strategies are. Their strategies are every period that I'm in there, I'm going to be making the best response to what the other guy's making in that period. And I can just, we're just repeating that over and over again. Okay. Now, it turns out that is a, that, that's a Nash equilibrium of the big game. It's a, that pattern of play is for each pair, player a set of best responses to what the other player is doing. However, there's also a pattern of play which is an Nash equilibria, which doesn't involve you playing these uh, uh, combinations of, of the Nash equilibria at, at each stage. Okay, I'm going to put this little diagram up here, but I don't want you to pay too much attention to it, okay? except that it describes the payoff possibilities in this repeated game when we're just adding up the totals. Okay, so here's the say for here's example red two blue eight. There's a red two blue eight sitting up over there. How about a um, uh, a red 5, a blue 7, red 5, oops, right there, blue 7, sits up here, these dots, okay? So these dots basically describe all the payoff possibilities in total in this repeated game. The ones with the triangles around them are the payoffs you get if you just play, okay, I'm going to say it again, but you always want to be able to translate it, if you play in each stage a Nash uh, strategies for that stage game by itself, okay? So, for example, the 2 and 8 that we said was, well, that's just playing A and Z in the first stage, A and Z in the second stage, so that's the total payoffs up there. That's the payoffs that come from that combination, okay? 
Now, it turns out that this little guy over here, we can get as a Nash equilibrium of that repeated game that doesn't involve playing these best responses all the time. In particular, what we can do is we can work with that idea that at the beginning, the, the, blue, the red player would like to get this four. Okay? That's a nice payoff for the red player. So the red player can think of a strategy which says, and implicitly promises to the blue player that if he would just agree not to play this best response Z in response to the A, so play X instead, okay? it's going to drop you from 4 down to 3, but I'll reward you in the future. Instead of playing my red strategy B down here and you're going to get a lousy 1, I'm going to play my A so you can get a big 4 in the future. Okay? So that's what um, I've put down uh, over here. Now, in this little table, what I did is, I, let's imagine that they do play A and X in that period, okay, in the first period. So I chunked through this down here, and then I went through, and I added the 4 and the 3 to every one of the cells in the stage 2 game to figure out what the total payoffs are going to be, to figure out what they would do, and sure enough, we get our, our two Nash equilibria here. Okay, but the nature of the strategy is this. The strategy choice for the red player has, um, is conditional on what the blue player does in the first round. Okay? And it's basically saying, look, if you play X, which is against your best interest in the first round, okay? it's, we figured that out, that it, if you just look at that one-shot game, it's against your best interest to play X. If I play A, you're always better to play the uh, Z and get that higher payoff. Okay? But if you do that, then in the second round, as a red player, I will play A, and then you can play Z, and you're going to get your big payoffs for. But if you deviate, then we're getting, for example, here, if you deviate, if I play A, okay, you know, the best thing to do in that first round is to jump out to 4, to play, no, to Z, to play, uh, to get a payoff of 4. If you do that, then I'm going to play, because I can look around and see that you've done that. In the second round, I'm going to play B, and then you're going to get, you're going to get stuck with this lousy payoff of 1 in the, in the second period. Even though you got 4 in the first, 4 plus 1 is 5, okay, uh, you're going to get stuck down over here, whereas you could have been up over here at 7. Okay? So the idea, the idea is to, to uh, of these repeated games, is you can think, oh, there's more opportunities here for getting cooperative behavior, or at least, if it's not cooperative, it's, it's not best response behavior in a stage game, okay? Or doing something that's against your best interest in an earlier thing, because in the future, you're going to get rewarded or punished, okay? So, I mean, that's a simple idea, and we, and we, we all carry that through in any kind of repeated interaction that we have. You know, like in a job situation, you know, you're, you're, um, um, you're working away on your salary, and uh, you haven't got any commission, you don't have to worry about stuff too much. You know, you could be playing computer games with a computer or, you know, playing on the Internet or, or phoning your friends or just kind of relaxing a bit, not really putting in too much effort. You know, but you also know that if the boss can see that, they're going to get a little bit uptight, you know, and, and uh, you're not going to get the promotions, you're not going to get the raises. Uh, there might be a little, you know, there's something that's going to cost you in the future. Now, this idea of the repeated game tries to take that... Uh, um, put that together and say, yeah, the future, as long as the future matters, okay, rewards and punishment matter, and what you can do is have strategies now. It's hard to draw game trees in repeated complex situations, but you can think about them saying, there is a past, we can see it. If you do good things for me in the past, I'll do good things for you in the future. If you do bad things for me in the past, I'll do bad things for you in the future. Okay? So that's the idea of, um, that comes out of this, this um, finite, finite repetition of a simple game, okay? And in particular, it actually helps to have multiple equilibria in these games. Because one of them you can use for the reward strategy and the other one you can use for the punishment strategy, okay? So that's kind of nice. It turns out um, uh, in some games that don't have this multiple equilibria, you'd like to get some sort of repetition thing going, but you can't, Okay? Because there's only, and that'll, if you look at a finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, you know, repeat it once, repeat it twice, repeat it three times, and it stops. You go to the end, and you think, oh, at the end, the pl player's going to do the defecting strategy, and they're going to get some payoffs, okay? And then you go back to an earlier stage, and you say, is there anything I can do to get him to cooperate at the beginning? 
Well, the end, he's, 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 no, he's just going to have his defect, his strategies to defect and to do the non-cooperative things. And that's a real problem. It's a repeated, it's called unraveling of cooperation with the finitely repeated versus dilemma. He'd like people to cooperate. Everyone would like to get these good outcomes. But because there's an end game and they're intelligent, they go to the end and they see at the end, they're going to take advantage of me, okay? Everybody's going to not cooperate. So then if I go back one step, there's nothing I can do at these earlier stages which will change behavior in the future and we'll get unraveling of cooperation. But if we have these multiple equilibria here, you've got an equilibria where, like the Battle of Sexes type thing where one player can be punished. Okay? The blue player can be punished by if the red player plays a strategy associated with this e equilibria as compared to the strategy, and you can reward him by playing the strategy associated with that equilibria. Again, you think of the, if we think of rewards and punishments, which are behaviors, but the rewards and punishments which look back at the past, see what people have done. Okay? No communication. You don't have to have communication, but you have to have observation. Right? The, each player is sitting there, they can see what the other player has done. Um, I mean, they might have communication. It might be that cheap talk communication that the text talks about, but they've got the direct observation of what's happened in the future, and they can change their behavior. That's what their strategy is. Okay. So, let's have a look at... Um, uh, let me just sort of see if I can put this together for you. We started off okay, with the idea of a repeated game. And we introduced a new concept called the stage game, which is the basic game that you are repeating. And we're trying to keep things simple, you know, so that's basically the same game. And we, we just used a little two-by-three game, but it could be anything, right? Any one of those simple little games, the chicken game, the, you know, the battle of sexes game, the assurance game, uh, the entry deterrence game... Um, Prisoner's Dilemma game, lots of little things could be repeated. We then thought, well, what are the payoffs in these repeated games? And if you think of the payoffs as sums, just the total that a person gets, then what we, we found, we found a couple of things. Okay? The first concept is to think of what do you predict is going to happen in the overall game? Not just in one of the little slots where you're looking one at a time, because that's a one-shot game, but in the overall game where you're taking this all together, we want to look for Nash equilibrio, which is a set of mutual best responses in the overall game. Those mutual best responses in the overall game could come from a bunch of mutual best responses in the, in the short-run games or the stage games. Okay? But we also have this opportunity and these are sometimes called reputational equilibria, but the whole thing can be, they can all be called reputational equilibria. You can get this non-best response behavior. I want to say, I mean, for a game theorist, you say, oh, it's not Nash equilibria in the stage game, because that makes sense to people who are in, uh, used to working with the idea of Nash equilibria. Okay. But then you might say, well, really what it is, is that it's non-best response behavior. People doing things which aren't in their best interest in an earlier stage because they're rewarded or punished in a later stage. Okay, so if, if I say, or you say, non-Nash equilibria in the exam and you're writing things, and I'll, want, I'll pretend that you know what you mean, and I hope that you do. Okay? But you should be able to translate and say, what is non-Nash equilibrium behavior? Well, it's doing something against your best interests in an earlier stage of the game. And why would you do that? Because in the overall game, there's future payoffs which are better for you. Okay? So, in, a, in, a, if you, in another way to think of it, in the short run, you put up a lot of crap in relationships because you think the payoffs in the long run are going to be good. Okay? Overall good. Not always good, but overall good. And you're worried about punishment too, right? Okay. Let's, let's get into this punishment stuff, okay? I mean, we might as well be sort of you know, masochistic, sadistic, whatever. I didn't bring my whips and chains and leather and stuff of like that, but... And, um... I mean, this is... This, yeah, okay. No, don't, don't go there, John. Okay. okay, now what we're looking at... Uh, what we're going to look at now is what's called the infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, okay? And remember, the prisoner's dilemma is this, is this kind of a strategic interaction. It's simultaneous... Uh, where each player is a dominant strategy, but this dominant strategy brings them to an outcome where they, it isn't very good relative to... If they just didn't play their dominant strategies, they have something better. Okay? Now, this particular game that is a pricing game, and uh, the payoffs are supposed to be in profits. Okay? So that if red player... 
does the cooperative thing, then th their profits are going to be 60. If the blue player does the cooperative thing, uh, their profits are going to be 60. So if they both kind of charge high prices, you know, they're, they're going to, um, uh, uh, you can think of cooperation for them as charging high prices. They're going to get pretty good profits overall. But if the blue player keeps this price at a high price and the, the red player defects a little bit, you know, lowers this price, it's going to bring some business, get some more profits for itself, hurt the other guy. Also, if the, red, if the blue, did I say that right? When, I meant the red player defecting or charging a lower price. If the blue player defects or charges a lower price, then if the red player is charging a higher price, the blue player's profits are going to go up from 60 to 70. The red player is going to be hurt. Okay. And that's the temptation. Okay. And the person's dilemma always has these, this sort of structure that, oh, I've got the temptation to pay off or to, um, uh, to improve my payoff. It's going to worsen the payoff of the other guy. And then if we both succumb to the temptation or to the defect strategies, we both end up worse off than we were when we cooperated. Okay, that's the, the guts of the prisoner's dilemma. One shot prisoner's dilemma. Now, a finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, could you get cooperation in early rounds and uh, have threats and promises for the future rewards? Well, not in theory. <laughs> it happens in experiments lots. Uh, and people try to figure out why. What is it about people's beliefs, you know, that they, they're exploring around in these experiments, seeing if they can get ways of cooperating and, and getting uh, good outcomes. But at the end game, the very last period, the idea is, in that last period, and there isn't any future to worry about, and if these are your payoffs, you're not going to be able to sustain that cooperation. You expect players to play their dominant strategies. When they play their dominant strategies, they get these, jointly bad outcomes and they missed the cooperative one. Then if you go back one round earlier and you think, well, okay, I'm expecting bad stuff, non-cooperative stuff in the, in the, fi in the pre next round. What can I do now? Well, nothing, because I already know what's going to be. I'm just adding other numbers that I expect to get in the last round out of my payoffs. Now, it's just a fixed number. I expect, I know what's going to expect, sorry, I know what's going to happen or I expect that I know what's going to happen. And I come work out my pass and, uh, for the, for the, the uh, uh, second to last round. I'm just adding pre numbers that I know what uh, predicted from the future. And I keep folding back and folding back. And it just unravels. It's like we can't get cooperation in theory. Okay? But now what we're going to see is we could get cooperation in theory with a little bit uh, more interesting strategies. And we, we, um, we're going to repeat this game once, twice, three times, and indefinitely into the future. Okay? And we use the idea indefinitely is that it could be a long time or it could be a shorter time, but you're not really sure how long, which means like you don't know whether the relationship's going to continue or not. And you're uncertain about whether that relationship's going to continue. Okay? It, you know that it's probably finite, but you don't really know when it's going to end. So there's some probability of it happening or not happening in the future. So that's why we call it indefinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. Um, we have, um, I just, I, I didn't put this down for you. It's, it's just a little sketch of a game tree. Remember in that we could represent a, a simultaneous game with a payoff matrix here by a sequential game with the information set. So we, you know, we have here the first time we play it. And then we have, at each branch, we have the second time we play it. And then at each branch, we have the third time we play it. You know, it gets really hairy to draw this whole scheme in. And what we think of is that basically there's some path of play that you're going to wind your way through in these repeated games. Okay? And it gets kind of complicated to, to describe the thing. You're sort of saying, well, if I do this and the other guy does that and he does this and I do that and, you know, you know that gets pretty hard. So what we do is we... We think up some strategies. They're called trigger strategies. And the trigger strategy idea is just a, it's kind of a way of boiling this complexity down and saying, look, at, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing something like cooperating all the time. I can, and as long as the other guy is cooperating, I will keep cooperating. But there will be some event which will trigger my change. Okay? And that's why it's called a trigger strategy. Then, so we don't have to worry about all this if-thens and buts. We're just saying, I'm going to do something consistent until I see the other player do something and then I'm going to change. And that's called a trigger strategy. Okay. Now, you might trigger back as well. Okay. And there's two we're going to look at. One's called the grim strategy and one's called the um, uh, uh, tit for tat. 
So let's have a look here. Uh, let me. Sorry, I got my. Uh, I want to get rid of these guys here. And that one. Help. <laughs> um. Okay, so we've got the idea of the repeated payoffs here. Now, or the repeated stage games. We have to think about payoffs. Okay. What are the payoffs in a game where you don't know what's going to happen? Well, we already worked it out, right? We took probability weighted averages of things. We said, well, you know, when you're uncertain about various payoffs, then what you do is you kind of average out. You know, if you're going to get a, maybe 100 here and 10 over there, and you're not sure, then, but you think it's really likely you'll get the, the 100, then you put a high probability on that one, okay? Well, here we have that uncertainty element, but we also have a time element. Okay. So what's happening is that we're getting a, a, a sequence of payoffs. Let me just put these up here. We're getting a sequence of payoffs. Say we've got some history that we go through. We've got 36, then we've got 50, we've got 60. We're sitting here in the present. We're wondering, what's going to happen? Am I going to get these things out in the future or some other future stream like this? And the way that the payoffs are understood in, in, in these repeated games is that a person looks present, they like the present payoffs, the future payoffs could be discounted or weighted lower. We don't want to just add up what's going to happen in the future because the future is uncertain. Okay? So that means we put a probability weighted average on that and so we discount it. Or it could be that I'm kind of impatient. I like stuff now. Okay? I don't want to wait after in the future. Now every teenage relationship between a male and a female or same-sex relationship is like this. Okay, I don't want to, one person, I don't want to wait, the other person, I want to wait. Okay. It's like impatience, okay? Um, the, um, the other thing is that if it's money you're thinking of, you know, you might be a little bit worried about money off in the future isn't worth very much. Okay? We're in high inflation times, you know? Uh, interest rates are really high, you know? And uh, I like money today, say, because it gives me a high rate of... And, a rate of return. You know, you're, you're looking at money out in the future. It's not worth very much in the markets these days. Okay, so the interest rates could matter. The opportunities you have, but the idea is that you will discount the future in some way. Now, there's two ways of expressing that, uh, the notion of, of discounting, which get quite confusing, and I don't expect you to 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 uh, do the math in the in the in the textbook answers to these things. Okay, we thought about a stream of payments you're going to get in the future. Like you might get 70, you might get 36, you might get 50, you know, wh whatever it's going to be. You look at those payments and you'd say, ah, oh, 53 periods away, that might be worth 20 now, okay? And then you look at uh, 36, two periods away, and you might say, okay, that's less than 50, but it's closer, it's a little bit better, uh, and that's worth something, okay? So the idea is you discount each of the streams, then you add up those discounted payments. Okay. Now that discount factor I like, that's why I like to think of it as a discount factor. I'm discounting the future. And I'm, why am I discounting it? Well, because I like things now. I'm impatient. The other reason is that it's uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen out there, so there's a probability it won't happen, and I'll, I'll kind of use that to weight the future. If it's really unlikely, I'm not gonna, and it's great, I'm not going to put much weight on it. Okay? So I'm, I'm reducing, I'm discounting the future. The other <laughs> unfortunate terminology, which I think is the concept of a discount rate, Okay. Uh, which is what the text use. I, I like the discount factor. It's like you've got some, some number you're applying to these future payoffs and you're, you're making them smaller because they're in the future, either because you're impatient or because they're uncertain. Okay. One way of expressing those is through a discount rate, which is instead of discounting the, the, the future, you're saying, okay, there's money, in the, something in the future and I'm, I'm lowering it. You can say, I've got a, a percentage discount rate where I say, look, at stuff today is worth a lot more than stuff tomorrow. How much more? Well, R percent, where R is an interest rate. Okay. So just re realize there's a confusion about uh, expressing a discount rate, uh, or it's discounting, how you look at the payoffs. I think that I like the terminology of this discount factor, but if, you, if, you know, if you've done accounting and you like discount rates, fine. Okay. So let's have a look at these, uh, some actual payoffs from uh, trigger strategies. Now, the Grimm strategy is the first trigger strategy. And the Grimm strategy works like this. 
Um, two players playing grim strategies against one another will be in Ash equilibrium. And the grim strategy says, okay, we're going to cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. As soon as I see you defect, as soon as I see you cheat, I'm out of here. Okay? We were, my partner and I were watching Six Feet Under, um, an episode of Six Feet Under. I don't know if you ever watched it. It's really very amusing. It's, and, well, actually, it's great. I'm surprised that it came out of, of the States. But there's this gay couple in there, and they have this open relationship kind of thing. And one of the guys wants to kind of to, to close it off. And my, Lynn and I are chatting about this, and I'd say, you know, I don't, how can you do this? You know, I just, you know, once a person cheats, I, I can't. I'm going to get trust. I'm out of here. You know, and Lynn's saying, oh, I don't know. It could work. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's like, you know, the... Uh, uh, I like the grim strategy in relationships like that. Okay, other people, you know, a little different. But the idea here is that uh, each of the players is playing cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. But as soon as, a de as soon as that other person deviates and does the wrong thing, it's not only that you're out of there, you're not cooperating, you're out of there forever. Okay? Now, so that's a strategy. It's a grim, we call it the grim strategy because there's no coming back. Okay, we'll see tit for tat is a little more forgiving than that. It, uh, but let's have a look just... At, this grim strategy and see what the payoffs are. So, the red players kind of uh, going along cooperating, the blue players go along cooperating. We reach period four and the blue player decides to defect. Why would they defect? Well, in the short run, they get plus 10, okay? So that's the short run gain. But what happens in the future is as soon as they defect in the next round, the red player is looking back and saying, aha, I saw you defect last time, okay? You cheated, I saw it. If they don't see it, that's, bit, you know, that's a, not so much a problem, perhaps. But if they do see it, then they're defecting as well, and they're going to continue to defect. And once they're defect, they've committed to defecting, then you might as well defect as well, okay? Because otherwise you're just a sucker. So you're going to get payoffs of 50 and 50 and 50 as a blue player. So what happens if we look at the difference in payoffs between those two? So if we look at the difference in payoffs between continuing to cooperate, where you'd be getting 60 all the way through, versus this pattern here, which is where you defect once, and because the other guy is going to defect forever, the grim strategy, you keep defecting, you're going to lose 10 every period in the future. That's yeah, worry about that. I don't want these, these payoffs. Now, then you have to say to yourself, well, how much does the future matter? Supposing I apply some discount numbers. Now, I just, I just pulled out these, these discounted payoffs. I said, well, the first 10 that you're going to lose, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit away. I'm going to discount that to four. And the second 10, that's even farther away. I'm going to discount that to three. And things that are three periods away, who cares? That's one. Now, you think I'm crazy. You might think it's a little ridiculous. Think of politicians. They are in office for three years. What do they think beyond three years? You know, well, there's some probability that I might get back in office again, but their time horizon is really, really short. Anything beyond that time horizon of three years, they, uh, at least it's my belief, you know, they don't care, <laughs> right? So they're discounting the future really highly. On the other hand, you know, in a, in a kind of established relationship, when you, you, know, you get uh, to know people, I think that their discount factors aren't too high. They, they, we, the future matters to them. Our relationship in the future matters, okay? Now, in this, in this particular game, if, the, if you discount the future heavily, then it'll be more worthwhile to get that short-run payoff than it will be to take the long-run cost. Okay? So that's, the, that's kind of the trade-off. And, and the if is the really important thing. It's like, how much does a person uh, uh, value the, the, future, the future? If their payoffs are such that they don't discount the future too highly, one if. And the second thing, if there's not too much of a... Uh, of a temptation gain. And the third thing is there's not too much of a punishment loss, then we should be able to sustain cooperation. Okay, let's run through that again. Okay? The idea here is that the grim strategy is playing one against the other. When will it be better to cooperate rather than deviate? Well, you've got the short run gain. If that's really high, you know, even if you get a lot of losses in the future, it's going to outweigh it. Okay? But if it's moderate in relationship to the, to the losses in the, in the future, it could still be worthwhile not to deviate, not to play your best response, just like in that simple little game, doing something against your short-run best interest. 
because the overall payoff isn't worth it. Why isn't it worth it? Well, there's some uncertainty, uh, uh, but it's not too much uncertainty. I'm impatient, but I'm not too impatient, okay? That is, I value the future. If you value the future, then, and how do you value it? Well, again, there's time preference and, and uh, the predictability, the frequency of interaction, the, you know, the bene future benefits of interaction, lots of things that help us develop a theory of reputation. Why would people cooperate now? Because when they look to the future, yeah, it looks good. You get in a situation where the future is really uncertain. Um, you don't know how long it's going to last, not very long. You're really impatient. We're talking teenagers here, um, or even younger children, okay, much less adults who are kind of going through midlife crises. It's like, uh, it doesn't matter. You're going to take that short-run gain. But if you can do things which will um, either build up, sort of reduce the temptation, or build up the punishment or improve the opportunities for future cooperation, that's where you're going to get this uh, um, ability to support um, cooperative behavior in the short run, when you couldn't if it was only a one-shot game. Okay, now tomorrow, um, I'll just have a quick look at the grim, at the tip or tap strategy. You can read about that. It's the same kind of calculation. The only thing is that you don't lose stuff in the future because... The other person's going to let you come back into the game if you start cooperating again. And so then you have to weigh up, you know, what's your short-term gain from, from uh, uh, deviating versus the, the, a shorter loss that you might have from um, when the other person will keep defecting, but they will turn back, they will, they will allow you to come back into the game and cooperate. Okay. And then we'll, we'll use the same idea to think about reputations and the trust and the, uh, the threat game to get onto credible commitments. Okay. Just one other thing. I did mention, I have the last two weeks, that every exam, final exam, I have asked a question, and I will ask it this year, the ten ways in Dixit and Skeeth about how to make threats, promises, and commitments credible. Okay? There's a, it's a really nice discussion about ten pages in Chapter 10, and I want you to be able to write one or two sentences about those ten different ways, and perhaps give a little example. Okay? That will be worth 20 marks.